It is good to be here, gathered, and gathered as one, for we are one family in Christ Jesus. He is our strength. He is our shield. Tonight, I just want to encourage you, lift up your voices, lift up your praises to our God, our King. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We pray, Lord, speak to our hearts, Lord. For there is no God like our God, the one we serve, the one we praise, Lord. For you are worthy to be praised. How we love you. We thank you, Lord, because you are the one who loved us first. You went to that cross, you died for our sins, Lord. And we want the world to know that you did it for each and every one of us, Lord. So we will praise and lift up our hands and cry out to you, O oh Lord, O oh faithful one. We love you. We praise you. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Put our hands together. Hold me in your arms. Never let me go. I want to spend eternity with you. Hold me in your arms. Never let me go.
you came down, Lord, and you gave your life for us. And tonight, Lord, we will remember and we will let the world know that you are the one who came. And you died for us, oh Lord. You gave your life so that we might live. And your love, that's how fierce your love is for us. That's how much you love us, Lord. And we thank you for that love. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your mercy. We pray that tonight it would pour down on us, Lord, that your word would speak to our hearts tonight. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your amazing love, so furious for us. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, good evening once again. Good evening once again. <laughs> Tonight, if you are 
uh, visiting for the first time, we would love to welcome you. Uh, so I'm going to ask you if you would please raise your hand and uh, keep it up high for a few seconds because we just want to welcome you. We want to give you that lone, that lone Mountain warm welcome. Is anybody visiting tonight for the first time? Raise your hand. Keep it up high. Don't be shy. Oh, there's one person in the back over there. Awesome. Come on. Take this time to greet one another. Go find someone you haven't met before. Go say hi to that person. Then go say hi to all your friends. Good evening. Good evening. We have a few announcements before we get into our study tonight. If you have a cell phone, please just take a second. Make sure that you have it on off or mute so we don't have it go off during the teaching of the Word and we're not distracted tonight. If you haven't checked it out, we have a new web page design. It's the same address, the ccloanmountain.org, but it's totally revamped and it's uh, you know really nice uh, banners and everything else. And so we invite you to come and check it out. Uh, just go ahead and go to the same address and you'll find it. Ladies' Worship and Prayer Night is going to be tomorrow. And they're also going to have dessert potluck. That's going to be at 7 p.m. Monday, tomorrow at 7 p.m. Join the women in the fellowship for a night of prayer, worship, and enjoying desserts and just worshiping God to, uh, together as women. And then lunch on the lot, next Sunday, June 12th at 1230 after the second service, we're going to have lunch on the lot. That's our fundraiser for the Mexico mission trip uh, for the summertime that the youth always do. And so please plan to have lunch after the second service. The proceeds will go towards scholarships for the mission trip. The menu is teriyaki chicken bowls for next week. And then also, uh, regarding food, we're going to have men's breakfast. So that's going to be June 18th. That's a Saturday at 8 a.m. We don't, I don't think we have the menu for that yet. But please come join. What was that? Bacon. Yeah, they mentioned that. Whatever is on the menu, bacon is going to be included. And so please join for that. That's going to be a time of fellowship, uh, worship, uh, short devo, and just men coming together and learning and studying God's Word together. And so that's going to be... Saturday, June 18th at 8 a.m. And if it's your first time for the men, it's on the house. All you have to do is, though, is notify the bookstore so they could jot that down and make enough for uh, breakfasts for that morning. And with that, we'll call the ushers forward to pray over their morning, or evening tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your abundant blessings upon our life. We know, Lord, that every good and perfect thing comes down from your hand, and we acknowledge that. We worship you, Lord, with what you've put into our hand. We worship you with our giving. We pray, God, that you would bless the evening tithes and offerings, that you would use it, Lord, to build your people up in their faith, to make disciples, to advance the gospel, to magnify your name. We know, Lord, that this life is only temporary, it's here just but for a short time, Lord. Like your word says, it's just but a vapor. Here for a while and then vanishes away. We want to make the most use of our time, our talents, our treasures, and the things, Lord, that you get in trust to us, Lord. And we thank you and we worship you with all we have. In Jesus' name, amen. Devoted, 
Well, good evening. Pastor Jimmy is taking a well-deserved rest after the many events of the last week, and in particular, the uh, wedding of his son yesterday, and uh, he's uh, asked me to fill in for him, and I'm happy to do so. We're going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes this evening, so if you have your Bible with you, open to Ecclesiastes chapter 5. If you don't have your Bible with you, we do want you to look at the Word of God for yourself, read it for yourself, and so the ushers are standing by to lend you a Bible if you need one. Just raise your hand like people are already doing. Keep it up till they get to you, and let's go to the Lord, ask Him to bless our time in His Word. Father God, we give you thanks and praise, Lord, every time we take the time, every time we take the, the moment to come and, and approach your throne, Lord, as you've told us to do boldly, we thank you and we praise you, Lord, that you've invited us to do so and that you will never reject us and you will never turn us away when we honestly seek your face. And so this evening, Lord, we seek your face. We turn our hearts to you in worship and in praise and in the study of your word. And we ask, Lord, that you would reveal yourself to us through your word. And Lord, we pray especially tonight for anyone here who may never have put their trust in your son, Jesus Christ, that tonight would be the night of salvation, of forgiveness of sins, and of eternal life. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So as I said, I'm super glad that you're all here tonight, but I wonder why you're here. I mean, you know, there's plenty of things we could be doing instead of being here, right? I mean, it's a hot, beautiful, hot day, and, you know, we could be sitting in a pool somewhere drinking lemonade, right? And you say, oh, pastor, no, 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 no. I'd never blow off church to sit in a pool somewhere, right? Yeah, me either. But let me give you another scenario. Maybe instead we could be out doing some street evangelism, right? We could be out on the streets evangelizing the lost, sharing the gospel, passing out gospel tracts. You know, my wife and I were having this conversation, <laughs> oddly enough, sitting in the pool yesterday. Um, you know, why, for those who have the gift of evangelism, what keeps them from evangelism, evangelizing all the time? And so we had that conversation. So, so we could be out doing that. Or, you know, we could say, um, you know, we could be resting up for the work week ahead instead of gathering here. I mean, after all, half of you were in church this morning, right? We've already been to church once this week. Isn't that enough? Why are we really here? What, what do we gather for? And yet we do. We take time out to come to church. And why do we do that? And perhaps an even better question than why is, is how is it that we go about that? Well, Solomon has a few things to say about that. Solomon, uh, in the... In the uh, in his book, Ecclesiastes, has a few things to say about that. He was what the world would later call a natural philosopher. That's what they called scientists before there was science. And so a natural philosopher is one who, who observes nature very carefully. He watches what the animals do, and he, and he watches the plants over time. And, and over time, he, he, after making these careful observations, he draws conclusions based on what he saw. That's what Solomon was. And he didn't just observe the animals and the plants, but people as well, and we'll see that in a moment. But um, and by the way, I don't have slides tonight, so you need to warm up your Bible fingers, get ready to find stuff, or, or at least take notes of the references I'm going to give you. The first one is 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 32 and 33. Speak of Solomon. 1 Kings 4, 32 and 33. And this is what it says of Solomon. It says he, he spoke 3,000 proverbs, and remember what a proverb is. A proverb is, a, is a, a, a saying of wisdom, right? Solomon spoke 3,000 of them. And his songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees, from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, and of creeping things, and of fish. So this was Solomon. He was a natural philosopher. He watched the bugs. And then he wrote about the bugs, and he spoke about the bugs, and he watched the trees, and he wrote about them and spoke about them, and he taught people. He was a scientist before there was any such thing as science. And he also studied man. His study of the nature of man is recorded for us in the book of Ecclesiastes, and in reality, he was his own most important subject. He, he studied his own life later toward the end of his life. He looked back on it. 
And, and this is what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. So as we study the book of Ecclesiastes, and we're obviously only going to look at a little tiny part of it tonight. By the way, the, t- the title of tonight's message is Walk Prudently. And we're only going to cover the first seven chapters of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. I mean, seven verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 5. But as we do so, we need to understand that Ecclesiastes is a poetical book. It's a book written in poetry. And it is um, kind of unique, uh, well, I'd say very unique, in the Scripture. He, as I mentioned, Solomon was writing towards the end of his life. And he's recounting his own search for meaning. Solomon, you know, he started well, seeking after God's own heart and building the temple. But then... He followed his wives into uh, false worship and, and worshiping false gods and, and all sorts of things. And all throughout his life, he, he sought meaning in various different things. And the book of Ecclesiastes is all about how I sought meaning here, and I sought meaning there, and I sought meaning there, but I never found it. And over and over again throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, he said all was vanity. In other words, this is all just a waste of time. All of these things where I sought meaning was all just a waste of time. And every section of it ends with vanity of vanities without God. And that's the ultimate conclusion. And we won't get to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, but we'll mention that conclusion again. Now, it's in this context that we look in chapter 5, that Solomon looks in chapter 5 at what we might call religion. And in religion, he found vanity. And we'll see that. He says in verse 5, I mean in chapter 5, verse 1, walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. So I'll go back to my original question. Why do we go to church? Well, first of all, We know that the scripture exhorts us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And for most of us in this room, at least, the Bible says to do it. That's good enough for me. Here I am at church, right? And and that's true. We should should look at the commands of the Bible in just that way. The Bible says to do it. That's good enough for me. But, you know, sometimes it helps us to understand the why. Why does the Bible command us to not forsake the gathering of ourselves together? What's the point? of church, you know? Is it to keep the Sabbath holy? Well, that's a commandment. It is a commandment to keep the Sabbath holy, and the the Ten Commandments weren't eliminated on on the cross, and so so we're still called upon to keep the the Sabbath holy, but (laughs) the truth is we don't meet for church on the Sabbath, and so that's not the reason that we come to church. We don't actually go to the church, go go to church on the Sabbath. Um, So why then do we? Well, we actually have a lot of reasons for coming to church, and many of them are really, really good reasons. Many of them are really biblical reasons. Here at Calvary Chapel on Mountain, one of the main reasons that we like to come to church is the fellowship. We love to hang out together. If you don't believe me, check out the parking lot about 9 o'clock tonight, and you'll find about four or five families still out there fellowshipping, even though the church is all locked up and dark. People just don't want to leave, right? And, and this afternoon, when we finished the church service at about 12.30 this afternoon, by 1.30 or 2 o'clock, there were still people hanging out. They just couldn't stop talking because we love each other and we love to fellowship together. And that's a good thing. And believe me, I am not about to say that that's a bad thing. But is that the reason that we're called upon to go to church? Certainly, many of our children, especially About junior high school age, that's the only reason they come to church, so they can hang out together. And that's as it should be. What's a better social center for our lives than the church? But even that social aspect of church really should have a purpose. And that same scripture that exhorts us not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together tells us about that. Look there with me if you want to, or take a note. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25, Paul writes or the author of Hebrews, writes, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, so much more as we see the day approaching. The purpose of our fellowship is not just to have fun. The purpose of our fellowship is not just 
to enjoy one another's company. Those are good things, but we should be enjoying one another's company. We should be sharing that fellowship in order to stir up love and to stir up good works and to, and to exhort one another. Exhort one another to do what? Exhort one another to greater holiness. Exhort one another to more wholehearted service of God. Exhort one another to greater love for our neighbor. That's what fellowship should be all about. Paul addresses this also in the book of Colossians, in Colossians 3.16. He says, Colossians 3.16, he says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart in the Lord. One of the reasons we gather together is what we just did, to sing songs together. That's an important part of what we do. That's not just something that we do so everybody has time to get in the building. Some people take it that way, but that's not the purpose of the 25 to 30 minutes of music that we have at the beginning of our church service. The purpose is that we exhort one another in the singing of these songs, that we lift one another's spirits, that we prepare our hearts to approach the living God. That's the purpose of worship. But is fellowship and that sort of worship the whole purpose in gathering together for church? No, it's not. Fellowship in and of itself cannot be our sole motivation for gathering in church. Solomon says, draw near to hear rather than give the sacrifice of fools. What is the sacrifice of fools? Well, the sacrifice of fools is a sacrifice that is of no value. It's a sacrifice made in vain. It's a sacrifice maybe for presumptuous sin. That is that, is that sin where you know ahead of time it's a sin and you choose to do it anyway knowing that God will forgive you. In the days of Solomon, it would be knowing that I could go to the temple and make a sacrifice and God would cover that sin. Today, it would be, it would be committing that sin knowing that Jesus already paid the price for that sin on the cross and so it doesn't matter. God has grace for me. That's a presumptuous sin and that's the sacrifice of fools. It may be a sacrifice brought to be seen by men instead of to please God. Proverbs 15.8, Proverbs 15.8 says, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. You know, a wicked person could come in here and make a sacrifice, a, per- a wicked person could come in here and write a $10,000 check and put it in the offering. And that's not, that's just one of many small ways that we make sacrifices today. But a person could do that, write a $10,000 check, it would be an abomination to the Lord if that person was wicked and unrepentant. God cares about the condition of our heart, not the actions that we take and sacrifice. But you say, wait a minute, Pastor, we don't, we don't bring sacrifices to the house of the Lord anymore. So what Solomon's talking about doesn't apply to us. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. Romans 12.1, which if you're here on Sunday mornings, Pastor Jimmy talked about, I guess not last Sunday, but the Sunday before, uh, in Romans 12, chap- uh, chapter 12, verse 1, Paul writes, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So yes, we do still make sacrifices for God. The nature of them is different. The reason for them is different than in the day of Solomon, but we still make those sacrifices. Our sacrifice merely takes a different form. Psalm 51, verses 16 and 17 has... Uh, is very instructive when thinking about sacrifice. If you're taking notes, Psalm 51, 16, and 17. The psalmist writes, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. That's the sacrifice that God desires from us. A broken heart, a contrite spirit. That is one who says, Lord, I recognize how how depraved I am. I recognize how wicked I am, Lord, and I repent of that. Wash me clean, Lord. 
accept my sacrifice. In the book of Hosea, the prophet put it a different way. Really, God speaking through the prophet put it a different way. Through the prophet Hosea. In Hosea 6.6, 6, he said, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And that's really getting to the heart of what Solomon is saying. He says, he says draw near to hear. Well, to hear what? To hear the word of God. To hear God's voice speaking to you. To hear God speaking into your life and speaking into your heart to change you from the inside out. So the question is, do you come to the house of God expecting to hear from him? We should walk in these doors with the expectation that I'm going to hear from God today. Not that I'm going to hear from Pastor Jimmy. Not that I'm going to hear from Pastor Chuck. Our, our goal is never to give you our opinion. Our goal is to give you the word of God. And so we should come, we should all come with the expectation. Today, tonight, I'm going to hear from God. I'm going to hear what God has for my heart. And when you come with that expectation, you're never never disappointed because God always speaks to us and so often I hear people say pastor Chuck I don't know that message was for me I don't know if it's for anybody else but it was for me you know why not because of me not because of anything in me other than the Holy Spirit of God the Holy Spirit speaks to us through our pastors through our teachers through the written word of God and so we need to come to that also with that teachable spirit with that idea that I'm going to hear from God today so do we come with that teachable spirit or do we come with a critical spirit that says, I'm listening to the worship music so I can criticize it. I'm listening to the teaching so I can criticize it. I'm listening for the pastor to make a mistake and say something that, that he didn't really mean to say or that the Bible doesn't really say or some, you know, that, well, that's not what Pastor Chuck Smith said and you're different, you know, you, you can't contradict. Yeah, you know, that's, we're coming with a, with a critical spirit rather than a teachable spirit when that's what we're looking for. Now, believe me, I'm not telling you, don't ever, don't ever come and tell me I said something wrong, because if I said something wrong, I want you to tell me. If I said something wrong, I want you to go find it in the scripture and point it out to me, because I want to be corrected. And I know for a fact that Pastor Jimmy feels the same way. But if our spirit is, that's all I'm looking for, let me, let me note every error, then we have a problem. Because we're not hearing from God. We're only hearing from Pastor Jimmy. We're only hearing from Pastor Chuck. We're only hearing from whoever the pastor is that's teaching, if that's the case. We need to come with that teachable spirit. We need to come to hear, draw near to hear, not to bring the sacrifice of fools. Solomon admonishes us not to come into the house of God to bring the sacrifice of fools. And, and how do we do that today? Well, if we come to church only to be seen by others and make an impression, then we're coming making the sacrifice of fools. If we come to church only for the fellowship, again, the fellowship is good, but if that's our only reason for coming, we're making the sacrifice of fools. If we come in the hopes of bribing God, look God, I've sacrificed my time and my energy and even my money to come to your house. Now, Lord, you have to bless me. If that's what we're doing, we've come making the sacrifice of fools. If we come out of guilt toward men, we're bringing the sacrifice of fools. If we come out of guilt toward God, that's the right attitude. Because we are guilty before God. But I, I can tell you a, a, a quick story. When we lived in New York, my, uh, the, our neighbor across the backyard happened to be the pastorage, or the, the, the um, what do you call it? The, um, I can't think of it, where the pastor lives. I can't think of the name of what they call it, the house where the pastor lives, right? Of this nearby church. And um, my wife was young, I was young, but my wife was even younger, and she was uh, pregnant with my first son and with our first son, and... Um, and I happened to be away, you know, in the, in the Air Force. They sent me away. I was in Alabama. She was in New York, and it was cold winter. And as uh, my wife was in the house there together, 21 years old, living away from home for the first time in upstate New York where it was, you know, 10 degrees and three feet of snow on the ground, 
the furnace died. The furnace went out, and it was cold in the house. And so she was there, eight months pregnant with an overcoat, and there came a knock on the door, and it was the lady who lived in the parsonage. That's the word I was looking for, the parsonage, the pastor's wife. She knocked on the door, and she said, I was on my way home with some groceries, but I felt like the Lord was leading me to stop and check on you. And, but I see that you're on the way out. And my wife said, I'm not on the way out. I'm just cold. <laughs> so, so she, you know, the, the pastor's wife figured out what was going on. She called her husband. Her husband came over to work on the furnace. She took my wife to her house and made her soup and hot chocolate and just loved on her. We weren't going to church. We didn't know who these people were. But, boy, they sure poured out their love on my wife. And then my wife said, well, now i got to go to church. Because they treated me so nice. I'm guilty, right? I'm, I feel guilty. i got to go to church. So she went to church. And then when she went to church, it was this little tiny church. And really, really, man, they loved the Lord there. And they taught the word of God there. And we thought they were these weird, fundamental, psycho Christians. And, and, but, you know, I'm still away. And I'm hearing all this on the phone. And she said, yeah, I went to church. And they were all really nice. And I'm like, okay. They found out that she was eight months pregnant and away from home, and they said, we have to throw this girl a baby shower. So they threw her a baby shower. And my wife came home from the baby shower with all these gifts, and she said, now how long am I going to have to go to church to pay them back for this? <laughs> right? She was going to church out of guilt toward men, and she was making the sacrifice of fools. Now, praise God that good came out of that, and God used that for good, and here we are you know, some 30 years later almost 30 years later, 29 years later, and here we are serving the Lord full time, and praise God that that was the beginning of a journey for us. But we came offering the sacrifice of fools. Solomon says, walk prudently when you go to the house of the Lord. Now remember, when Solomon's speaking of the house of the Lord, what's he talking about? He's talking about that beautiful temple that he himself had built. That was considered the earthly dwelling place of God. So when, when Solomon talked about the house of the Lord, he's talking about going to the temple, right? It was understood as the, as the earthly dwelling place of God, but when we come to church, we're not entering into the presence of God. And that may be radical to you to hear me say that. When you walk through those sanctuary doors, you're not entering the presence of God. Why? Why? Because the presence of God is, is available to you, with you, all the time. That's one of the things that Christ accomplished on the cross. When we, came, when, we, when, when we enter into prayer, we experience the presence of God. When we enter into the study of his word, we enter into the presence of God. When we enter into worship, we enter into the presence of God. The presence of God is never away from us. And so, no, we don't come in to church to come into the presence of God. Of God, We don't come into his house in that way. So what does it mean then for us to walk prudently? And how does that apply to us today? Well, Solomon is telling us to come before the Lord with reverence. He's telling us, reminding us that, that when we come into the presence of God, whether it's through private prayer at home in our closet or whether it's through coming to church and worshiping and fellowshipping and praising and singing and studying together, we need to do so in the, in the awareness that we're coming before a holy, righteous, and all-powerful God. You know, we don't, we don't have a culture here at Lone Mountain that says this sanctuary is a holy place. And I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But we don't have that culture that says, shh, you're in the sanctuary. Be still. And that's okay because it's just a room, right? And God is here, yes, but he's here no more than he is out in the lobby or out in the parking lot or in our car or in our shower. So it's okay. But at the same time, that same attitude sometimes spills over into a lack of reverence during times of prayer and worship. And there are times when, when we're in prayer and some of us are moving about, and I'm not pointing fingers at anybody without pointing fingers at myself because we do it too. We're supposed to be gathered together in prayer. Pastor David is leading us in, in a short prayer to ask the Lord to bless our time of worship together, and what are we doing? We're moving around. 
We're not praying. We're not joining in with that. And during worship times, sometimes we get distracted during worship times, and instead of lifting our heart toward the Lord in worship in preparation for the study of God's Word, instead, sometimes we're carrying on a conversation. And that's not the attitude that Solomon's talking about. When he says, walk prudently in the house of God, walk prudently in the presence of God, this is what we need to do. We need to cultivate this idea that, that when we're in prayer, when, when somebody is on this stage in prayer, we're all in prayer. And when we're all in prayer, we stop and we pray and we're silent. When we enter into a time of worship, we need to understand that corporately, together, we're worshiping and we're lifting our hearts together toward God. And to the best of our ability, we need to enter into that and join. And maybe we don't like to sing, but we need to open our mouths and praise the Lord. Because our voice is precious to him when we lift up his praises. We need to gather together and do that. We need to cultivate that spirit that says, I'm reverently entering into the presence of God in prayer and in worship and in the study of his word. That's what Solomon's talking about. Solomon continues in verse 2. He says, Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven, and you on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. Is Solomon telling us to be careful what we say to God because God doesn't already know what we're about to say? Of course not. God knows, in fact, David said this in the Psalm 139, verse 4. Psalm 139, verse 4. He says, For there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Before the word actually forms in my mouth, God hears it in my head. So when Solomon says not to be rash with our mouth and not to let our heart utter anything hastily before God, he's, he's not telling us to be careful. You ever, you ever heard this? Be careful what you pray for. And, and the idea being that if you pray for something, God may turn that around and twist it on you and make it something you don't like. That's not the God we serve. Our God is a God of love, and he wants what's best for us. And he's not about twisting our words. And that's not what Solomon's getting at. But what Solomon is getting at is that we should seek to be better at prayer. Now, that's a funny thing to say. It, it sounds almost blasphemous to think that you could learn to pray better. It seems almost, somehow to me, it seems almost like you're cheapening the idea of prayer to think that it's something that you could study and get better at. But the disciples went to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us the pr to pray, just as John taught his disciples to pray. Clearly, praying is something that you can learn. And if you can learn it, then certainly you can learn to do it better. That was in Luke 11.1, 1, by the way, if you, if you don't remember that. That's the, uh, the introduction to the Lord's Prayer, as the Lord taught his disciples to pray with that model of prayer. But the Bible has a lot to say about the quality of prayer. And Solomon just has some of it here. He says, don't be rash in your prayers. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with that quickly uttered emergency prayer. Lord, don't let me crash, right? There's nothing wrong with that prayer. But it better not be your only prayer. It better not be the only time you pray when you feel like suddenly there's a crisis crashing down on you and Lord, help me. But when you enter into sincere, serious prayer, you should prepare your heart for prayer. Warren Wearsby says, that's the secret to acceptable prayer. Acceptable praying. <laughs> I want my prayer to be acceptable. I want God to accept my prayer. And the secret of it is to prepare my heart. And what does that mean? Just as Solomon said, walk prudently in the presence of the Lord. Recognize to whom you are praying. Uh, the... Um, I'll think of his name in a second. I didn't write it down. R.A. Torrey, in his book, How to Pray, talks about this very thing. He says, he says that the prayer of power is the prayer that's rendered unto God. But won't you say, aren't all prayers rendered unto God? And no, they're not. If you do not stop for a moment and recognize to whom you are praying, 
to the, the creator of the universe, the one who holds it all in his hands, the one who has made you and knit you in your mother's womb, who holds together all the matter of creation. That's to whom you're praying. Don't pray to God like he's the ATM in the sky. Don't pray to God like he's your earthly father. He is so much more than that. And we need to recognize that. And that's what it means to, to pray in that way. Psalm 141, verse 2. Psalm 141, verse 2 says, let my, prayer, let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting of my hands as the evening sacrifice. That speaks of a prayer that's been thought out ahead of time. That speaks of a prayer that not necessarily incredibly formal in nature, but a prayer that is thought out and planned. John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, wrote, In prayer, it is better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. Prepare your heart for prayer. It's a fool who enters into public prayer to be heard by men and ends up in the process being offensive to God. A fool's voice, Solomon said, is known by his many words. <laughs> Loudmouth fool. How often those two go together, right? You've probably all seen it at one time or another. The seemingly eloquent prayer that leaves you completely unmoved. Other big words and fancy words and, and maybe, the, maybe the raising of the hand as, as the person prays, but there's something about it that just leaves you empty. The words are soaring and high sounding, but there's no passion. They seem rehearsed and they don't reflect the person's heart. And here's a little secret. Those prayers leave you unmoved. They probably also leave God unmoved. But then on the other end of the spectrum, there's this person who prays with no eloquence of words, but with tears in their eyes and passion in their voice. And though the prayers aren't impressive, the prayer itself is poignant and eloquent in its own way. That's the prayer we need to seek to have. The prayer of passion. The prayer of the prepared heart. Verse 4, Solomon says, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. And once again, you say, hey, Pastor Chuck, you know, we don't enter into vows with God anymore. Well, you know, it's true that we don't have like a Nazarite vow, like in the Old Testament. We don't have those sorts of things where we enter into those kinds of vows before God. But we do enter into vows before God all the time and God surely takes those vows seriously and he takes our breaking of those vows seriously as well I'll give you an example yesterday pastor Jimmy led his son and his now daughter-in-law in vows before God and God takes those vows very seriously he expects justice and Brittany to take those vows seriously as well in the book of Malachi God strongly rebuked the men of Judah for profaning marriage, which he called the Lord's holy institution, which he loves. Does God take those vows seriously? Yes. And do we enter into those vows? Yes. Most of us, almost all of us, at one time or another, enter into those vows, and God expects those vows to be taken seriously for life. Here's another example. We make a vow before God to raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. When we do baby dedications, as we're going to do in two weeks from tonight, we ask the parents to vow before the Lord that they will raise this child according to God's principles and that they will enlist the support of their church family, you guys, all of us, to do that. And at the same time, we vow, all of us vow, to support that Christian family who have made this pledge. And there are other times when we make those kinds of vows as well. Or different kinds of vows, I really should say. Different kinds of vows. When we promise something to God. Lord, 
if you allow me to buy this F-150 pickup truck, I promise to use it in service to you. Now you laugh, but I made that vow. And I, most, many of you know, I drive an F-150 pickup truck. I made that vow before God. And there are days when I'll be sitting in my office and Pastor David will come into my office and say, hey, uh, can I use your truck to go to, uh, to go to Sam's to buy stuff for the church? And there are times when I feel like, I really don't want to lend you my truck. But I do, because I made a vow before the Lord. And I think I can honestly tell you that I have never turned down a request to use that truck for ministry, and I don't intend to, because I made a vow before the Lord. That's the, we make those vows. We do. Solomon reminds us that we take these vows before the Lord seriously, just as the Lord does. You know, I talked about marriage and, and baby dedication, and I know I wrote this, I can't find it in my notes, but I'll tell you anyway. When we do marriages, we, we have a policy here at this church. We won't marry anybody that we don't do premarital counseling for. That's a, a commitment that we have made before the Lord. And why is that? Because we want to make sure that the person, the people, the couple that we're marrying, that we're putting our stamp of approval on, is planning to take that vow that they're going to make seriously. We do the same thing for couples who want to do baby dedication. I'm meeting with a couple this week who want to do a baby dedication in two weeks. And you know what? I'm quite confident that we're going to have a 15-minute meeting. Do you understand the meaning of baby dedication? And they're going to say yes, and we're going to talk about that. And then we'll do the baby dedication. But I have turned people down in the past, both for marriages and for baby dedications. Why? Well, I use the example of the baby dedication. If somebody comes and says, we want to dedicate our baby, okay. But if you don't come to church, then how can you stand up here and make a promise to raise your child in the church and to enlist the aid of your church family if you don't even come to this church? You don't even know the people that you're asking to support you. How can you make that vow? You can't. And we have therefore turned people down for baby dedications. Now, I don't like doing that. I've turned people down for marriages too, and I don't like doing that. I tell them, you know what? I can't marry you. I'll, I'll counsel you but you're going to have to go down to the Justice of the Peace to get married. Or the you know, little Elvis Chapel, whatever. God still honors that marriage, by the way. But we need to understand that those vows that we're talking about, that's serious business. Wedding vows, a vow taken to raise a child in a certain way before the Lord, God takes them seriously. And so should we. Psalm 56, verses 12 and 13. Psalm 56, 12 through 13. The psalmist writes, Vows made to you are binding upon me, O God. I will render praises to you, for you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living? Vows made before you, Lord, are binding And that means I've got to obey them. Verse 6, do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. We're still talking about vows, by the way. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams, in many words, there is also vanity. But fear God. There are two ways to mess up with vows before God. The first is to make a vow with no intention of keeping that vow. That's what I was talking about with the, with the couple who wanted to do a baby dedication. But the father didn't even come to this church. I felt really bad for the mom, because the mom did come, want to come to this, or did come to this church. And we said, you know, we can, we can have you vow, and we'll do that. But dad, no. I felt bad for her. But We can't do that. So the first way is to make a vow with no intention of keeping it. That's the first way that we can mess up. The second way that we can mess up in making vows is to make a vow hastily and then in delaying or refusing to keep the vow because we changed our mind about it. That's a dangerous thing. We utter a vow in crisis. Lord, if you deliver me from this situation, I'll sell everything I own and go into the mission field to serve you full time. 
And then when the crisis passes, you begin to evaluate. And when it's time to pay up the vow, you try to tell God, you know what, God, it was an error. It was a mistake. I didn't mean to. I really didn't mean to promise that. Lord, you have to let me off the hook. Warren Wearsby said, people make empty vows because they live in a religious dream world. They think that words are the same as deeds. Their worship is not serious. So their words are not dependable. They enjoy the good feelings that come when they make their promises to God, but they do themselves more harm than good. They like to dream about fulfilling their vows, but they never get around to doing it. They practice a make-believe religion that neither glorifies God nor builds Christian character. I, I think Wearsby really hits the nail on the head, but in one particular way, especially. He says, their worship is not serious. You remember what that word worship means? It's ascribing worth to God. That's the origin of the word. And if you are not serious about the way you ascribe worth to God, then you will do all kinds of foolish, foolish things in the name of religion. Solomon concludes this section by saying, but fear God. Wow. That little, tiny, three-word sentence says so much in so few words. When we err in the making of vows or in taking the presence of God too lightly, it is, at root, a failure to fear God. Solomon hints here at the conclusion of the entire book of Ecclesiastes. Look at the very end of the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, the last two verses. After all of that, looking at the different ways that Solomon sought meaning in life, and every time he sought meaning in a different place and in a different way, in good things and in sinful things, he came to the conclusion after each one, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. But at the end of the book, he says this, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. For God, fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. We don't keep any secrets from God, not even the secrets of our innermost heart. But this is the conclusion of the whole matter. Man's all, everything that we were created for is for this, to fear God and to keep his judgments, to bring glory to his name. That's what we were created for. That's what God intends for us. That is his will for us, that we live a life that brings him glory and honor and praise. Now, Solomon ruled the nation of Israel, and he wrote in the midst of a time when reconciliation with God meant living strictly in accordance with a complicated law. And it meant every time you messed up with that complicated law, you went before the priest and you followed a detailed ritual of blood sacrifice. And yet, even in the midst of that, Solomon recognized and he shows us that God's love is about our heart, not our religious practice. Micah realized that too in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Micah 6, 6 through 8. The prophet writes, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah got it. It's about walking humbly with God, not against God, not running away from God, not running perpendicular to God, but walking with God. That's what it was all about, and to do so humbly. All through the Old Testament, God required men 
to make sacrifices and to carefully follow the law. But the law and the sacrifices were never intended to be the ultimate end. That would come when Jesus Christ came as our kinsman redeemer. Open your Bibles to Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. If you haven't been opening to every reference, that's okay, but open to this one if you would. Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. Hebrews 9, 12 through 15. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all. Having obtained eternal redemption, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a, heifer, of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. All of those laws, all of those intricate rules of, of sacrifice and of, of religious service to God, all of those do's and don'ts of the Old Testament, all of them, were fulfilled, not partially, not barely, but overwhelmingly by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Jesus, as we sing, paid it all. He paid the debt for every sin. And so we come boldly before the throne of God, as he commands us to do, as he invites us to do, through the veil, into the holy of holies. And Christ himself, the very flesh of Christ, is that veil through which, by which, we enter in to the presence of God, to worship him with our whole hearts. And we come to God for the forgiveness of sins, for the granting of everlasting life, only because of the sacrifice that was made. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this sacrifice. We thank you and praise you that, that you showed us through the law, through the complicated ritual of the Old Testament, that there is no way for us to approach you. There is no way for us to achieve forgiveness of sins, to achieve perfection in this life, Lord, except as Jesus himself has said, no one may come to the Father except through me. Through Jesus, we come to the Father. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your Son to make a way, to be the way, for forgiveness of sins and everlasting life. As we remain in an attitude of prayer with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed, if you're here tonight and you've never put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he came to be our kinsman redeemer, the one who was legally authorized to pay the price we couldn't pay, to redeem the life that we had already lost. We were dead in our trespasses. We were dead in our sin. And our kinsman redeemer came to mark the bill paid in full. And through him, we might have life. So if you're here tonight, you want to put your trust in him. His word says that if you trust in him, if you, if you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Is that you tonight? Do you want to put your trust in him? If you do, would you raise your hand and let me see, let me pray with you? 
We just want to acknowledge the work that God is doing in your heart. Is that you tonight? He's making that invitation. He's pointing out to you that you can't do it yourself. No amount of sacrifice, no amount of religious fervor, no perfection of religious ritual can get you into heaven. Only the blood of Christ spilled on your behalf. I praise God then that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ here tonight. And I thank you, Lord, as we enter into this time of communion. I pray, Lord, that you would use this time to build up our fellowship, to draw us into Christ, and therefore together, 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 together. Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Ushers, pass the elements. The place where mercy reigns and never dies. There's a place where streams of grace flow deep and wide. Where all the love I've ever found is like a flood comes flowing.
Yes, Lord, our sin ran red. Our sin gushed red, Lord. But your blood washed us white as snow. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. And we enter in tonight, in this time of communion, we enter into fellowship with one another. We enter into fellowship with you and we identify with you, Lord, as we take these elements together. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it. I am stunned that on that same night in which he was betrayed, took that bread and gave thanks and then said, this bread for which I've just given thanks represents my broken body. It's as if Jesus was saying, thank you, Lord, for breaking my body on the cross for them. That is exactly what he was saying. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take of the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This cup was part of a, a familiar tradition to Jesus and his disciples. It's a cup that had a name. The name of this cup was the cup of redemption. And he was about to show them how the new covenant involved redemption through his blood. And he said, take this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take of the cup together. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We proclaim his death and we do it with joy. Why? Because we know that death couldn't hold him. We know that he's alive and he is coming again. We, we, we proclaim his death with joy because it's his death that gives us life. It's his blood that washes us clean. It's his body broken for us that saves us. And so we do so joyfully and our prayer is, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Father, I thank you for this time of communion. I thank you for our fellowship together. I ask you, Lord, to bless us mightily in Jesus' name. Let's all stand, please. May the Lord richly bless you, cause his face to shine upon you, and draw you into that attitude of reverence and awe and prayer and gratitude and thanksgiving and love that is our due in Christ Jesus. David, send us home.
his love be poured down on us. Amen. Have a great evening. God bless you all. Pastors and elders are up front to pray with you and to pray for you. Please come up if you're in need of prayer.